You're watching the Weekday Report. Spotlight NJ. Heading to the Museum to learn about the artwork of some of America's earliest artists. That's right here, right now, on the Weekday Report Spotlight NJ. To achieve this goal, we'll be touring the museums in the long-term exhibit the, new, the Native Artists in North America. We'll really see artwork by some of the leading Native artists in the art world. Not to mention never-before-seen pieces from the 18th and 19th centuries. But enough pretext. Let's get right to it. We're here in the North Wing of the Native Artists in North America exhibit. We're here with William Coleman. Uh, besides being here for church purposes, he's going to help serve as an interpreter and help us understand the scope and the meaning of this art. So, William, could you give us a bit of an overview of the exhibit and what it's going to be about? Sure. So where we're sitting, we are in uh, one of the two main galleries that make up Native Artists of North America. And we're trying to imply by the way we phrase the very title of the exhibition that we're taking these people seriously as artists in the same way we would artists from Italy or something. All too often, uh, museums exhibit the work of native peoples in special galleries of anthropology or science. But we're taking these things that are all around us seriously as works of art. What you see in the background uh, are mostly works from the Pacific Northwest, Washington State, Oregon, even into British Columbia, where there was a particularly rich artistic culture. What we're especially proud of is that the choices about what to display and how to display it were made by members of the represented tribes. So we went to uh, peoples in each of these modern, still living native groups and asked them what they valued in their culture, what they thought should be on the walls of the New York Museum. So giving everybody a say in terms of display and what's displayed. Yes, indeed. So it's a kind of collaborative curating. We do have experts on staff here who make sure that the works we own are cared for, conserved, preserved in perpetuity, but we also want to make sure that everyone has a voice in these galleries. What type of art is displayed here? When and where is it originated? We have many different answers to that question. It's a good question, but a very big question. We have art going all the way from the time of first contact, pre-contact, before Europeans ever came to the United States. But one other thing that's a little unusual about these galleries is that we also go the other direction, right up to the 21st century. We're making the point that this is not just a work of people who existed in the past, but people who still have vibrant cultures today, native contemporary artists still dealing with the rich artistic legacy of their peoples. Um, so we're dealing with a whole span of the modern day United States up into Alaska, down to Florida, everywhere in between over hundreds of years. Well, with that, let's get right to it. Alright, so taking a trip back to history, uh, what groups made this art and what were their contributions? We have a number of different objects. 
was from uh, Pueblo peoples of the, uh, the southwest of the United States, both ceramics, which are maybe what we think of first and foremost as the great artwork of these people, but also things that are maybe more familiar to a lot of us, like paintings. And you'll see some of those on the wall around, uh, Pueblo watercolors, we call them, where native peoples are using um, a tradition of watercolor painting that has a long European history, but turning into their own and self-representation and choosing it to show native rituals. Um, in many cases, we know the name of the individual artist who made these things, and that's very rare. Um, often, we, we dig up a pot like this in an excavation in the Southwest, and we don't know exactly what hand, what maker is behind it. But as we look through this case, we see a number of names recurring. These black bowls in the front, the work of a very famous native potter named Maria Martinez. Um, and that style of black on black decoration from a mile away, I think would say, oh, that's got to be a Maria Martinez. So we have some individual, uh, very famous artists in this case. Alright, so going over to some of the more ornate arts, I have to, how many uh, Native Americans, or the term Indians, because it's historically inaccurate, mm -hmm. portrayed their cultures and their art? That's a good question. Many of the objects we're looking at here are fundamentally practical. A painting can't really do work for you in the same way a basket or a pot can. What we see here are examples of the heights to which a fundamentally practical object can be elevated. Some would say that we also use paintings, but it's very different. We don't eat off of a painting in the same way we might eat out of a pot or sift grain in a basket. Yeah, it's not that thing I would recommend that. Yeah, I wouldn't recommend that either. It sounds gross. But what we do have are people using the ordinary things of their daily life. They need pots for storage. They need baskets to hold things and move things around. And they're thinking about how they can make them more beautiful. This isn't so different from how we all think today about how we decorate our homes. We choose the beautiful things we want to surround ourselves with. We see that in baskets like these from the Pomo people of California. Looking at these Casina dolls made by the Hopi people of Arizona in the early 20th century, it kind of brings up a question, William. Does any of the artwork here have, like such as these ornately decorated pieces, have any religious or political meaning with the groups or the individuals that made them? Absolutely. It's a good question. We've talked a lot about the practical, ordinary, utilitarian objects that are elevated into artworks by decoration alone. But these things are not meant to carry water or grain. These things are explicitly religious objects. They're meant to be kinds of spiritual beings, rather, that will bless a home and confer good fortune on you and your family. Um, so these objects are charged with spiritual significance for the Hopi people. Uh, so, Will, what was the state of things in the Americas before Europeans arrived? What is important to remember is that art didn't start on this continent when Europeans got here. I think that's a common mistake. What we've seen in the galleries we've already been browsing is a rich visual tradition, even before European traditions and European materials arrived. Um, we see sculpture, we see pottery, we see all kinds of painting, um, using the natural pigments and colors of nature to make life beautiful, to convey spiritual meaning. And the sad and surprising thing is that a time traveler from the modern day would probably go back and see these peoples and they wouldn't be savage at all. I think that's true, yeah, that's a, a common word. There was a, a concept popular in Europe at this time of the noble savage, the philosopher Rousseau voiced this idea of a native person who was a kind of holdover from prehistory, a, a historic creature almost that had survived into the modern era. That way of thinking allowed people to have a certain kind of respect for Native Americans, but also to think of them as already historic, already past, not having any more role in the modern world. We can imagine how Native people have resented that notion that they are kind of quaint and charming, and isn't it cute how they live their lives so differently than how we live ours? Um, and the art that we display here shows how the Native people responded to that. So we're surrounded by some of the early works of European artists on this continent, um, portraying themselves, their own bodies, their own faces. There is another painting in this collection I'd love to show you that shows how some Europeans thought about Native Americans. Alright, let's take a look. Alright, so we're here in front of this painting which depicts the European view, at least, of Columbus's landing in America. And we apologize if any of our Native viewers are offended by this, but what is 
is the what is really the meaning behind this thing? This is a very strange object that has just gone out on view here. You're seeing very recent news at the New York Museum. Because it is just overtly racist and difficult to look at, it's been in storage for 20 years. What? Albert Bierstadt's The Landing of Columbus, painted in 1893. Um, this artist is famous for these grand landscape views of the American West, and this is a rather different kind of painting from him. Um, he went to San Salvador, the island where Columbus first landed. He documented what the trees and the landscape looked like. And then he added in this fantasy of Columbus and his men arriving in suit armor, praising God for their safe landing, lots of crosses in evidence. What's really painful to look at in this painting is how he's chosen to portray native peoples. Uh, many of them are clutching their heads in woe, they're weeping into their hands, they're sort of turning back to go into the forest and seeming, uh, seemingly passing into history already, inevitably being pushed aside by this civilization arising that it's not historically correct, it is not a fair portrayal of the vibrant civilization of the Taino people of these islands. Um, so it is a, a troubling image, to be sure. Yeah, frankly, to put it frankly, these people might have just been picking fruit and looking at the ocean when Columbus arrived. Yes, indeed. They're, that is simply proven that the Taino people actually were not savages. Like I said, a very thriving civilization. Sadly, along with many Caribbean groups like the Arwak, who are now only limited to the island of Dominica and the Caribbean, their numbers were largely wiped out by forced slavery, by a combination of forced slavery, European diseases, which have no immunity to, and, and the European settlers encroaching on their lands. That's correct. Frankly, but this is a very racist and historically accurate portrait, despite all the bright colors. Yes, and sometimes people got to look past that to look at its real meaning. We're urging people to, to get past that first reaction, just as we say, we thought hard about the explanatory text we would put on the wall next to it, and then not least, your viewers might be interested to see the choices we've made about what to surround it with. A proud self-portrayal by a Native American artist here, and a small drawing here, similarly, proud Native warriors on horseback, showing some uh, Native agency, choosing how to portray themselves in contrast to this. And once again, we apologize if anyone has been offended. But uh, let's move on to the 21st century. All right, heading towards a more positive note and back in the 21st century, uh, I, my question's been burning in my mind. Uh, what do you think is the current state of Native American artists in the art world? Native American art is alive and well, and it might be rather different than what your viewers might expect. We might expect Native American art to be pottery, and we might expect it to be basket making. But it's no coincidence that we're standing in front of a 2015 work of Native American art. It looks like a sleek modern form, this strange glass cube. Um, but it is, uh, if we look closely at it, carved with forms that are recognizable from long ago, the 18th and 19th centuries, the work of these same people, the Tlingit people of the Pacific Northwest. Here, Preston Singletary, a member of that tribe, is working with those historic forms that tell stories about a people and their past that might tell uh, legends about family ancestry. And he's using those forms instead on materials that have come over with peoples of European descent. So we see creative reuse and reappropriation of the materials of Europeans. Mm -hmm. uh, are there any young artists you want to know about, or any Native American artists that you would like to sure. shine a light on? Absolutely. So the Preston Singletary is one. Another interesting example is right over here. Um, this is the work of Virgil Ortiz. Uh, it, he's working with ceramics, a material that we think of as the product of the Cochiti people of the southwest United States, New Mexico. Um, but here he's decorating it in quite a different style. We see these strange kind of devil's horns and figures and faces. And um, even, I think you might be able to see a hand holding a hypodermic needle here. It might deal with the drugs crisis. It might deal with the fact that Native Americans who are alive today are dealing with great poverty on many of their reservations, drugs and alcohol addiction. There's a lot of struggle still with Native American people. And he's showing how Native American art can tell that story too. Uh, finally, uh, what is this exhibit's goal? Essentially, what do you want people to take away at, from this uh, exhibit after they leave? I guess I would say two slightly different things. The first is to show 
that art in North America was not invented by Europeans, that there was a long and a rich history of art making, uh, beautiful and useful objects, and indeed spiritually significant objects, long before Europeans ever arrived on this continent. And second, to show that Native American art is not only historical, that there is still a continuing and vibrant uh, practice of art making by peoples of Native descent. Mm. Well, thank you, Will, for taking this journey with us. My pleasure. Well, after paying a visit to this exhibit and seeing the lifestyle and culture of ancient Native Americans and modern ones too, I was touched. But the most impactful experience for me was to see all of these portrayed through their artwork and to see firsthand and understand it. In a time of making Native Native politicians and their increasingly isolationist policies, it's refreshing to see people take time out of their day then take a look back. Uh-uh.